For decades and decades, people have been reinventing songs written and released by other artists. Some are revered for sounding close to the original, while others are praised for thinking outside of the box and making covers their own. Today, I'm presenting 10 covers that I think are completely different than the originals they're derived from. Hi everyone, and welcome to Music Theories, where I explain and analyze all topics related to music. Be sure to subscribe for more content, especially if you're a music geek like me. Now before we begin, I want to start by saying that this list in no way reflects my opinion of these songs and the covers of them. I'm in no way saying that the covers are better than the originals, they're simply different from the originals. So without further ado, let's begin. Number 1. Gotta Get You Into My Life This tune was written by Paul McCartney and initially released on the Beatles album Revolver in 1966. The arrangement of the original includes a colorful brass section, which wasn't typical in the Beatles songs and was said to be a nod to the Motown and Stax Memphis soul sounds of the 60s. McCartney's vocals on this song are bright and the melody itself, in my opinion, kind of foreshadows the sound that he would later create with his post-Beatles project, Paul McCartney and Wings. In 1978, the soul group Earth, Wind & Fire covered this revolver tune for the soundtrack featured in the film Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The cover is massive from the jump, kicking off with some quintessential funk horn lines, clean electric guitar, and organ sounds. There's a minute-long vamp before the song actually begins, with each instrument gradually being added to the mix. The familiar Beatles melody is eventually established, but embellished by Maurice White's soulful vocal stylings just completely surrounded with a grand and tight funk arrangement, complete with grooving bass lines and horn hits. The critical reception of Earth, Wind & Fire's version was very positive, and they even received a Grammy for Best Instrumental Arrangement Accompanying Vocalists. Number 2. Proud Mary Creedence Clearwater Revival, also known as CCR, is an American rock group known for a lengthy list of radio hits in the late 60s and early 70s. Among these hits was Proud Mary, which was written by John Fogarty and released in 1969. Proud Mary was truly relatable for many Americans, as it was a seamless mix of white and black roots music, with its homage to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Country guitar styling and gospel-style vocal harmonies, the lyrics presented imagery from the South that many knew well. Two years later, the husband and wife duo, Ike and Tina Turner, would release their rendition as part of their second album, Working Together. The Turner's version was actually inspired by another cover, by a band called the Checkmates Limited, which is very evident if you listen back. But I believe that Tina's performance and Ike's arrangement in this cover are what separated the two. This version begins nice and easy for about 2 minutes and 20 seconds until it erupts no. into pure energy. With an elevated tempo and busy backing band, the tune is driven by Tina Turner's gritty and expressive voice that eventually became one of her signature performances. Number 3. Black Magic Woman the famous rock group Fleetwood Mac was originally made up of Peter Green, Mick Fleetwood, Jeremy Spencer, and John McVie. Peter Green wrote Black Magic Woman, and it was originally released as a single in 1968. Arranged minimally as a basic blues inspired by Otis Rush's All Your Love, the original version of Black Magic Woman is a simple drum groove underneath bass and rhythm and lead electric guitar. Santana released its version shortly after, in 1970, Carlos Santana's arrangement has more of a Latin influence, with some jazz and Hungarian folk mixed in to make it sound a bit more mysterious. This cover begins with a Hammond organ riff and includes a rhythm tapestry of congas, timbales, and other percussion played by Michael Shreve, sporting a 3-2 Afro-Cuban sanclave. The intro is actually an alteration of a Gabor Sabo tune, of course adorned with Santana's guitar stylings. And then Black Magic Woman actually kicks in around a minute 25. This version surpassed Fleetwood Mac's on the charts, possibly due to the spiritual quality achieved in the arrangement. Number 4. 
Number four, I'll be missing you. The English rock band The Police released their 1983 album Synchronicity. Included on this album was one of the band's signature songs, Every Breath You Take, written by Sting, which sat atop the Billboard Top 100 for eight weeks and has since been considered one of the most played songs of all time. This song is recognized for its soft, comforting arrangement and is often mistaken for a love song, though the warm arrangement is juxtaposed with dark lyrics about an obsessive lover. In May of 1997, Puff Daddy released a song honoring rapper Notorious B.I.G. after his untimely death just a couple of months before. This song featured the group 112 and Biggie's widow Faith Evans singing in the chorus. This song is technically sampling every breath you take, as opposed to covering it. But what I hear is a transformative cover of the original tune, with the B section omitted. The chord progression plays continuously underneath Puff Daddy's verses, in addition to the chorus sung by Evans. The most transformative part of this version is the recoloring of the lyrics in the original song, rewritten to express the remorse and longing associated with loss. There was a large legal dispute regarding the use of this sample, but that may be a tale for another time. This song has since become one of the best-selling singles of all time and stands as a beautiful tribute to a dear friend. Number 5, With a Little Help From My Friends With a Little Help From My Friends was a track off the 8th album release by the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This song was specifically written by Lennon and McCartney for Ringo to sing. With a little help from my friends has a short vocal range, and like other Beatles songs sung by Ringo, is a bit hokey and whimsical. This is largely due to the chunky block piano chords being played throughout and the shanty-like backing vocals. Though the song does feel energetic and playful, the arrangement is pretty minimal. English singer Joe Cocker did a cover of this song in 1968 which was also part of his 1969 Woodstock performance. He changes it quite drastically, the most significant difference being the time signature change. His version is in 6-8, where the Beatles version is in 4-4. Cocker's soulful and gritty vocal stylings alone make this feel like an entirely different song with a gospel choir adding body and flair to the mix. The bold electric guitar drives the song in the intro and the choruses, and the drums are much more active in this version than the original. The dynamics change throughout, starting out pretty grand and taking us on a journey from soft and introspective to loud and rambunctious. Cocker's version feels like a rock song, but the Beatles' original kind of feels like a pub song. This cover version received lots of fame and recognition after the Woodstock performance, and was later used as the theme song for the American sitcom The Wonder Years. It was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001. Number six, Respect. I actually have to admit that I had no idea that Aretha Franklin's Respect was actually a cover of a song originally written and recorded by Otis Redding in 1965. The major difference between the two seems to be the perspective of the singer, which changes the tone of the song completely. Redding's version is very energetic and propelled by a horn section in classic soul fashion. It's a similar tempo and style to the Franklin version, both of them being recorded at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Otis Redding's lyrics and tone imply that he's asking for respect from his wife in exchange for working hard all day long and bringing money home for his family. It's not necessarily a plea, but more of a comment on feeling appreciated in his own home. It's relatively straightforward and doesn't really have any other implied meanings or commentary. Aretha Franklin released her version in 1967, and with the help of her sisters, decided to flip the script and sing this from a female perspective. She demands respect from her partner, with a cheeky attitude and confidence that inspired part of the second wave feminist movement. The arrangement itself, while maintaining the Muscle Shoals sound of the original, 
is a bit more punchy and syncopated. With the added breakdown where she spells out the word respect, and her sisters sing sock to me in the background. The electric guitar adds flair, and Aretha's melodic phrasing is a bit more rhythmic, and creates the attitude that establishes the tone of the song. This cover is illuminated with energy and character, and has since become a soul classic. Number 7. Somewhere Over the Rainbow Somewhere Over the Rainbow, composed by Harold Arlen with lyrics by Yip Harburg for the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz, is one of the most famous songs in pop culture. It was originally performed by Judy Garland, who played Dorothy in the movie. The song is sung as a ballad, which suggests a sadness and a pining for something new, a longing for somewhere other than dry, arid, colorless Kansas. The original version is backed by a string ensemble that includes a harp, which creates a dreamlike lullaby feel with the help of Garland's wide phrasing and extensive vibrato. Israel Kamaka Vivole was a native Hawaiian singer-songwriter and Hawaiian sovereignty activist who achieved commercial success with his 1993 album, Face and Future. Included on this album was a medley of Somewhere Over the Rainbow and What a Wonderful World that was simply just Iz's incredibly soothing voice and his ukulele. He simplifies the chord progression quite a bit and is lenient with the melody, melodic phrasing, lyrics, and even the form of the song. The emotional tone of Iz's version is a bit different. While they're both optimistic, I find that the Garland version feels very pensive and sad from the perspective of someone who is essentially trapped. But Iz's version is comforting. It feels like he's speaking to everyone else rather than just himself. It feels like he's speaking about life and what comes after it in the most idealistic way. Number 8. Call Me the Breeze J.J. Kale was an American guitarist and singer-songwriter who more or less avoided the limelight. Even so, he was hugely influential on the blues scene and is credited with being one of the fathers of the Tulsa sound, inspiring the likes of Mark Knopfler, Neil Young, and Eric Clapton. Call Me the Breeze is a basic 12-bar blues released in 1972. It utilizes the blues guitar shuffle and an early version of the drum machine underneath Kale's confident and graceful guitar fills and solo. This song, like many other blues tunes, has been covered by various artists from different eras, one of the most notable being Leonard Skinner's version in 1974. The Skinner cover features a harder rock sound, with an overdriven lead guitar backed by layers of crunchy rhythm guitar and a light phaser effect. While it does still maintain that blue shuffle and a similar tempo, the layers of guitars and vocals, multiple solo sections, and even a horn section in the arrangement pack this song with energy. Number 9. Smooth Criminal Smooth Criminal is labeled as one of Michael Jackson's iconic songs, written by him and produced by the legendary Quincy Jones. The song was featured on the album Bad, released in 1987, and like most of Jackson's songs, was written to cater to his signature dance numbers. The original version of Smooth Criminal is a very calculated balance between R&B and rock starting off with just an edgy bass line and a clean, crisp snare. Jackson's vocal stylings are varied throughout. The verses are gritty and spunky, and he breaks into a falsetto in the chorus. The song later features a funky guitar lick and a horn section that breaks the mold of rock entirely. In 2001, the American rock band Alien Ant Farm released a new metal version of Smooth Criminal that transformed it into the genre. The cover featured the same very well-known riff, 
but put through a distortion pedal that immediately changed the feel of the song. The drum groove in this cover is way more active than the original, and the pre-chorus melody is less rhythmic, though the band does include some hits that aren't present in the Jackson version. This cover overall has a jam-packed arrangement that gives it a completely different energy from the original. Number 10, All Along the Watchtower. Last, but certainly not least, we have one of the most famous cover songs of all time. Bob Dylan wrote All Along the Watchtower in true Dylan fashion. Released in 1967, this song featured an acoustic guitar, a harmonica, electric bass, a basic quarter note drum groove, and Bob's iconic voice. The form doesn't change throughout, and Dylan effectively tells his story with his words and harmonica improvisations. Just six months after the release of the song's parent album, John Wellesley Harding, Jimi Hendrix covered All Along the Watchtower with his band Jimi Hendrix Experience and released it in 1968 on his album Electric Ladyland. This version has a much more extensive arrangement and is overall very edgy in comparison. It features an instrument called the vibraslap, which is most prominent in the intro and of course Hendrix's signature electric guitar stylings. The band's parts and dynamics are much more varied, and the cover has many sections compared to the original. This version surpassed Dylan's on the charts, and upon hearing it, Bob Dylan reportedly said, It overwhelmed me, really. He had such talent. He could find things inside a song and vigorously develop them. He found things that other people wouldn't think of finding in there. He probably improved upon it by the spaces he was using. I liked Jimi Hendrix's record of this, and ever since he died, I've been doing it that way. Strange how when I sing it, it always feels like it's a tribute to him in some kind of way. Jimi Hendrix's version of All Along the Watchtower has since gained a life of its own, serving as Hendrix's highest-ranking American single. It's always a pleasure to hear an artist do an original take on a pre-existing work. Whether or not we like those renditions better than the originals is for us to decide. Quick side note, I will do a separate video on jazz covers because the improvisational nature of jazz makes every rendition very different from the original. But what are some transformative covers that were not mentioned in this video? Leave those covers and other general thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe for more music history and analysis content. And of course, thank you for watching.